Para mí es un honor presentar a nuestro siguiente conferencista, el profesor Serge Aroch. El profesor Aroch nació en Marruecos. Se graduó de la Escuela Normal Superior de París y obtuvo su doctorado en la Universidad de París 6 en 1971. En 1975 fue nombrado profesor de tiempo completo en la Universidad París 6, cargo que ocupó hasta el año 2001, cuando fue nombrado profesor en el Collège de France para ocupar la cátedra de física y la dirección. Sus investigaciones han tenido lugar principalmente en el laboratorio Kastler Process de la Escuela Normal Superior, donde ahora trabaja con un equipo de alto nivel entre postdoctorados y estudiantes de posgrado. El doctor Aroche ha recibido numerosos premios y distinciones, entre ellas la medalla de oro del CNRS en 2009, es oficial de la Legión de Honor de Francia, en 1988 recibió el premio Einstein, en 1992 el premio Humboldt y en el año 2012 el premio Nobel en Física que compartió con otro de nuestros invitados especiales, el doctor David Weinman. La Academia de Ciencias de Suiza, de Suecia, destacó en el comunicado en que anunció los premios lo siguiente. Los premiados han abierto la vía de una nueva era de experimentación en la física cuántica al demostrar la observación directa de partículas cuánticas individuales sin destruirlas. Sus descubrimientos han sentado las bases de la actual investigación fotónica que aprovecha las propiedades de las partículas de la luz, los fotones, para crear nuevas tecnologías y profundizar en la comprensión de las leyes físicas. Con ustedes, el doctor Serge Aroche. It's a very great, great pleasure to be here, and I would like to thank Professor Enrique Correo for organizing this meeting and inviting me and giving me this opportunity to meet with. Colombian colleagues and with students, and I hope that this meeting here and uh, uh, during the next days in Medellin will improve and strengthen the cooperation between uh, France and Colombia, and Colombia and other countries. And I think it's a very <coughs> useful event. And celebrating the Year of Light is, of course, also very, very important. Uh, I am. Also pleased to have this opportunity to describe, I hope in simple terms, the experiments, the experiments I have been doing with my research group in Paris for many years. What we are doing is to trap photons in the box and control and manipulate these photons without destroying them. And by doing these experiments we are, so to speak, We are trying to realize uh, some of the thought experiments that the founders of quantum physics have been imagining during the 1920s. And these experiments illustrate some basic concept, concepts of quantum physics, mm -hmm. and they also demonstrate steps which one may be useful for quantum communication or quantum information. Yes. Basically, we are manipulating protons which are grain of light, elementary particles of light. And I will start by recalling a few features about the photon, which have already been, some of them have already been discussed in uh, earlier talks by Araspe or by uh, Boris Rodriguez. Uh, as you know, the photon is, has no mass. <coughs> it flies at maximum velocity at the speed of light. And it's a very common particle, in fact, it's the most common particle. There are photons everywhere around us. In this room, of course, visible and invisible photons. And they carry almost all the information we have about the outside world. If you can see the screen, you can see it, because photons are scattered from my body into your eyes. And uh, this happens for uh, 
give us all the information about our close environment, but also all information about the universe. Visible photons are, of course, important in astronomy, but invisible photons are also essential. Uh, you see here, you may have already seen this map, which represents in false colors uh, the uh, uh, light, the invisible light, the microwave radiation background that we receive from the universe. And the photons which have been captured in this kind of picture have traveled for billions of years since the early time of the universe, and they give us precious information in cosmology about the early days of our universe. What is also interesting to notice is that these photons are dead now. When you detect the photons, usually you destroy them. So the photons give us a message about the world around us, but this message kills the photons. And of course, it's not so important because there are so many of them, they're always renewed, but the photons which have been detected are no longer there. Uh, another feature, in, in free space, when they travel in the uh, in interstellar space, the photons are eternal. They have, can travel for billions of years without uh, any harm. But as soon as you try to capture them, to trap them, they are very fragile because they interact very strongly with the matter that you put around them. And they do not survive long in captivity. In the best optical fibers, the photons will propagate over hundreds of kilometers, uh, meaning microseconds, but then they will be destroyed or be absorbed. What we are doing in our experiment is uh, quite unusual. We observe photons uh, which are trapped during times of the order of one tenth of a second, and we can detect them repeatedly without destroying them. So we have developed a way to count the photons without absorbing them, and this allows us to perform the experiments I was mentioning before, uh, controlling the photons, building non-classical states of light with them, and trying to uh, uh, figure out what, what could be done uh, uh, for applications. Uh, I just recall you what happens when you detect light in usual ways. The photoelectric effect, which was, this, uh, which was understood by Einstein in 1905 in one of the seminal papers which started all the quantum history. Uh, what happens is that a photon impinges an atom and it just ejects one electron. Uh, and in the process, the photon is annihilated. So the photon is observed by detecting the escaping electron. And the same kind of process occurs in the ordinary vision. You get photons into your eye, the photons interact with molecules, with, with molecules and your, the cells of your retina, and they are transformed by uh, uh, photochemical effect into a signal which goes to your brain. But the photons are dead. So the question is, can we detect light without absorbing it? And I will tell you how we do that, but of course there is an ingredient which is essential if you want to do that, is that you need a good box to keep the photons long enough to be able to measure them again and again, not only to demonstrate that you have not destroyed them, but to be able to do things with these photons. And this is what uh, our experiments are about. Uh, as I said, photons are quantum particles, and this has been discussed already in, in previous talks, but uh, I would like to discuss that by uh, showing you here uh, the Young double slit experiment. In this experiment, which all physicists know about, a source of light is uh, <coughs> sun photons, sun beams of <coughs> sun beams of light uh, through two through a screen which has two slits into it, and then the light uh, goes through the, the screen and it gives rise to an interference pattern on the screen. This is, of course, understood very well if you consider that light is made of particles. Uh, of, uh, light is a wave, excuse me, because the waves which come through the two slits interfere with each other, and in some directions they add their effects, interfere positively, and in those directions, one of the two wavelets has a phase which is opposite to the other, and they cancel the effect. But this is very difficult to understand, if the photons arrive one by one. That is, if the source is, made, is emitting single photons. And this has been possible uh, in, in uh, recent times. And this is an experiment which has been done by Jean-François Roque in uh, Paris. And I show here the result of uh, the signal of a real experiment. You see on this screen, 
how <coughs> the interference pattern will build up photon by photon as the photon arrive on the screen. You see at the beginning you have a kind of random pattern and when enough photon has arrived, you see that the interference pattern is building up. So the photons tell us two contradictory things for a classical mind. They tell us we are particles because we give discrete uh, impact on the screen and as, at the same time, statistically, we are a wave because we uh, give rise to an interference effect. So how can you understand that? Uh, the only way to understand it is that each photon, when it crosses the screen, in some way knows whether the two holes are open or not. And this means that the photon does not follow a classical trajectory. If the photon was going through one hole, then it would be able to hit the screen anywhere. If it cannot hit this, the screen on a dark fringe, it means that in some way it crosses the screen through the two slits at once. And this is what uh, quantum physics describes as a superposition principle. I won't write any equations in this talk, save this one. The state of the photon which crosses the screen is a superposition of the state corresponding to crossings <coughs> with the, uh, the slit X and the slit Y. This is a superposition principle which is at the heart of quantum physics and which is a direct consequence of this wave-particle dualism. The same dilemma exists, of course, for matter. Electrons, atoms, molecules are also waves and particles. This has been, for the first time, stated by De Boyle in 1923. And the superposition principle applies to, to, the, to matter. And this will lead us uh, to the schrodinger cat problem, the fact that a uh, quantum system can be in two states at once. And I will say a few more words about this uh, just in a second. This is, of course, the wave particle dualism of quantum physics. And uh, Bohr, thank you, we have to eat. Thank you very much. This uh, wave particle duality was discussed by Bohr, who introduced the notion of complementarity back in the 1920s. Uh, I'd like to illustrate this by this uh, ambigram which you can read according to your frame of mind, light is a wave or light is a particle. Uh, of course, this is not just a psychological game. Uh, what Bohr had in mind is that the particle and wave are the two sides of the same reality and which reality emerges depend upon the experimental setup. Not about the way you think about it, but about the apparatus that you put to study the system. This means that you cannot uh, prevent, when you observe a quantum system, the system to, from interacting and from being perturbed by the apparatus with which it interacts. <coughs> Depending upon the experiment, the system will appear as a particle, which has a way defined trajectory, or as a wave, uh, which obeys the superposition principle. And uh, when Bohr discussed with Einstein in the 1920s, they try to imagine experiments to put this idea of complementarity to the test. And one of the experiments was the uh, modified version of the Young double slit experiment that you see here. This is a drawing by Bohr. You see the two slits are here, here and there. And what Einstein imagined that the upper slit was a very light device which was suspended onto the springs here. And what Einstein uh, said, is uh, if you want to find the path through which the particle went, you just have to detect the momentum transfer to the movable slit. If, if the particle, if the photon, for instance, is going through the upper slit, the slit will recoil and uh, it will start oscillating. And if the, this slit oscillates, it means that the particle went through the upper slit. If the particle went through the lower slit, of course, the upper slit will not move. So will you see interferences, will you see, when you accumulate photons, will you see fringes in this case? And Bohr could answer very quickly that according to quantum physics, the uh, fringes should disappear if you do this experiment, because it will require to define the slit initial momentum with a very small uncertainty delta P, because the change in momentum will be small. But if delta P is small, according to Heisenberg uncertainty relations, Delta X, the fluctuation of the initial position of the slit will be large because the product of delta X and delta P has to be larger than Planck's constant. So uh, 
what happens in this case is that the zero point fluctuations of this quantum oscillator will be large enough to blur uh, the fringe because of the past, because the past difference will no longer be defined. So Bohr was able, in, with this very simple thought experiment, uh, to show that, in fact, the idea of complementarity was uh, at the heart of quantum physics, of the principle of quantum physics, because Heisenberg and the uncertainty relations are at the heart of this physics. So it's not something that you add to the quantum theory, it's really imprinted within the principle of quantum theory. I like this experiment because it was discussed in 1927, and it already uh, includes the notion of entanglement. If you think about it, uh, if you look at the quantum state of the particle which crosses the apparatus, this particle has to be in a superposition of two states. It, it crosses through the upper slit, and at the same time, it crosses through, low, through the lower slit. But the particle is not alone in, in this experiment. The particle is interacting with the slit, and you see that now that if the particle crosses the upper slit, the upper slit will move, whereas if it crosses through the lower slit, the upper slit does not move. And from this expression, you see that the quantum state of the system particle plus slit is now entang an entangled state. Entangled meaning that you cannot write it as a product, the mathematical product of the quantum state for the particle time a quantum state for the slit. So Bohr and Einstein did not discuss that in these terms, but entanglement was already there, and according to a modern description of this experiment, it is an entanglement between the slit and the particle which keeps the coherence. And the explanation is quite simple. What, what this experiment means is that there is a quantum state for the global system, but there is no quantum state anymore for the particle itself. And if there is no quantum state for the particle, you cannot have any quantum coherence. And when you write down the equations and find out what's going on mathematically, uh, you find, of course, this result. What I also want to say is that this experiment is already a Schrodinger cat experiment. The, the, the slit, which is a big object made of many, many atoms, is at the same time moving and not moving. And this looks very much like this famous cat uh, that Schrodinger imagined, which was at the same time dead and alive. I just remind you here this uh, Schrodinger story. You have a cat which is in a box interacting with a single atom. And the atom is in a superposition of two states, an excited state uh, and, and a lower state. And if it goes from the upper to the lower state, it emits a particle which triggers a device which kills the cat. And if the atom is halfway suspended between the excited and the not excited state, the cat should be, at the same time, dead and alive. And it's exactly the same equation as uh, for the uh, uh, slit experiment I just discussed. Of course, it's much more dramatic here, but the physics is the same. And uh, what Schrodinger pointed out here is that as soon as systems interact, the superposition principle leads to quantum entanglement. And of course, it becomes rather strange when this entanglement involves a small and a large system. So it also raises the issue of the quantum to classical boundary. Why uh, don't we ever observe this kind of situation when we look at large systems? So this is, uh, I wanted to discuss a little bit this uh, thought experiments, I will discuss last one here, which is related to the issue I was mentioning at the beginning. Can we count photons without destroying them? And in fact, in the 1920s, Bohr and Einstein had an idea about that, and uh, they designed what is known as a photon box experiment. You know, in this experiment, they assumed that light photons were trapped in a box whose uh, walls were made of uh, highly reflecting mirrors, and the idea was how to know how much electromagnetic energy we have in this box without absorbing it through detectors. And Einstein's idea was just to weigh the box in the gravitational field of the Earth. So you see that you have here a meter which will go up and down along this scale if uh, uh, this box suspended to this screen weigh more, more or less. And of course this experiment is based on the fact that 
mass and energy are equivalent, so if you have some in electromagnetic energy in the box, you have something which will be sensitive to the gravitational field. This is general relativity. So to count photons without destroying them, you just have to weigh the box in the gravitational field of the Earth. I don't want to discuss this in more details, but I just want to stress that this experiment involves a clock here, you can see here, which is used to uh, uh, control the opening of this shutter here, so that you can time the exact time at which light quanta are escaping from this box. As we mentioned, as was mentioned already by uh, Dr. Boris Rodriguez earlier, Schrodinger and all the other uh, founders of quantum physics, at least I'm um, sure Einstein, uh, believed that this kind of experiment, these thought experiments, were just uh, kind of uh, intellectual games but that they would rema remain forever impossible. And we always quote this statement by uh, Schrodinger, dating uh, the year 1952, saying that we never experiment with single electron atoms or small molecules. We do that in thought experiments, but it always results in ridiculous consequences. At first, this sentence can look strange because in 1952, uh, single particles were already detected routinely in cloud chambers, in accelerator physics, and so on. And of course, Schrodinger knew that. But Schrodinger considered that this was completely different from uh, what we have in thought experiments because what we were observing then were traces of events which have passed, which uh, the particle that you see in these cloud chambers or in these collision chambers are uh, dead. They're, you just see the debris of collisions after they have occurred. And it's, it's, he said that very clearly when uh, he went on saying that it's fair to state that we are not experimenting with single particles any more than we can raise ichthyosauria in the zoo. We are scrutinizing records of events long after they have happened. In other words, Schrodinger considered that uh, particle physicists were like paleontologists, which were trying to make sense of a physical system long after the system had, had disappeared, just trying to, uh, to find out what was going on through a very uh, uh, long uh, gone uh, traces of artifacts. So things, of course, have changed, and now uh, we can control a zoo of particles in the lab, and this has been, become possible because of new technology, of course. Uh, lasers, and this brings us back to the International Year of Light, lasers which were, uh, this, which were the first uh, uh, developed in the 1960s, and especially tunable lasers allow us now to control with an exquisite precision the internal and external degrees of freedom of atoms. Uh, fast computers are essential if you want to accumulate data and correlations, in particular, which occurs at a very fast rate in this system. And in our case, we need also superconducting mirrors in order to build our photon cavities. And what I want to stress is that all these are quantum technologies. And uh, they have a load, the trap, the ion traps experiment, the photon traps that I'm discussing now, cold atom physics, and so on. So you see that there is a very interesting connection between, between uh, uh, basic physics, between blue sky research, and application. It is because we understood the microscopic world that these technologies have emerged, and from these technologies we get new tools to investigate further and further and get deeper and deeper into, into quantum physics. So the kind of experiments we are doing is uh, shown on this uh, slide. You see here the mirrors uh, that we are used, you know, we're using to track microwave photons. Uh, we send atoms one by one between these mirrors, and they interact with the field which is stored inside. These mirrors are, are made of copper machined with very high precision to avoid scattering on uh, mirror interfections, and they are coated with superconducting niobium, which uh, uh, bring the resistivity of these mirrors to zero and uh, 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 prevents all losses on the mirror surface. And with this kind of mirror, uh, light can bounce it more than one billion times between the mirrors. And if you unfold the trajectory of the light beam, 
the, the trajectory is on the average 40,000 kilometers the Earth circumference. <coughs> so we have a little bit more than one tenth of a second to perform measurement on the field. And the way we are doing it is to send atoms one by one through the cavity and detect the atom afterwards. The atoms are destroyed, but the photons in the cavity are not. We are, in fact, doing uh, a version of the Einstein photon box experiment. Of course, the photon box is made uh, by the cavity mirrors. And I will show you that the atoms which are crossing the cavity in many experiments are used in a kind of atomic clock. And we use information provided the mirror, provided by the atoms, to uh, measure time. And in fact, when you have light inside the cavity, the rate at which this clock uh, ticks is slightly changed. We are measuring this change. So we are doing, in fact, two kinds of experiments. In one kind, the atoms are <coughs> resonant with the cavity mode, and they can emit and absorb photons in the box. And we did many experiments of this kind. And in the second kind of experiment, we slightly detune the cavity from the atomic transition, so no photon absorption or emission can occur, but the atomic energies are slightly shifted by the interaction between the light and the atom, and we use this light shift to get information about the photons inside the cavity. For that, we need special atoms, which are called Rydberg atoms. They are very excited atoms in which one electron has been promoted to an orbit which is going much larger than in the ground state. So we start with an atom in its ground state, and using lasers and radio frequency excitation, we just excite an electron on a very large circular orbit. This orbit has a radius of about one-tenth of a micron, which is 1,000 times larger than the ground state. So it behaves as a huge antenna, which is exceedingly sensitive to microwaves, as I will show in a moment. If you want to describe this atom using quantum physics, you have to use the Bohr's ID. This atom is a, the, the electron going around the core is an electron wave, and the quantization condition is that you need to have an integral number of these wavelengths around the circumference. And in fact, the number of wavelengths around the circumference is called the principal quantum number of this circular impact state. Here you have 51 uh, such uh, wavelengths. If you look at this picture, you also see that the electron can be delocalized anywhere on the circle so that its center of gravity coincides with the nucleus, so you have no electric dipole. If you need an electric dipole, what you do is to admix the state E, which has principal quantum number 51, with the state G, whose principal quantum number is 50. And by microwave pulse, the classical pulse of microwave radiation, you prepare a superposition of E and G. And this superposition is very simple to understand in classical terms. You have two waves which, have, which differ only by one wavelength around the circle. So clearly, the two waves will interfere constructively at one end of the orbit and which subtract at the other end, so that you will have, in fact, a wave packet which will be centered at this point, and this wave packet revolves around the nucleus at 50 gigahertz, which is a low frequency between the two states. So you see that what we are building here is a kind of classical atom, which looks like the atom of the old Bohr theory of 1913, and you can think of it as a planet revolving around the sun, as the early models of the atom were uh, introduced, and, but also as uh, the hand of a clock on a dial. And this is the image I will be using in the following. What do we detect in this experiment? In fact, we detect the atoms by ionizing them after they have crossed the cavity. And uh, I will try to explain on this slide the process of ionization and how it can be used to selectively detect the atomic state. You see here the Coulomb potential of the atomic a nucleus, and you have here the two bound states, E and G, which are very close to, to the ionization limit of the atom. If you apply an electric field uh, to this atom, it amounts to adding a linear potential, the slope being proportional to the electric field amplitude, and you see that now you will lower the energy barrier at one end to the point where the upper state will escape, so you, you will ionize the, the atom in this electric field but the lower state is still bound. 
And if you want to ionize the lower state, you have to increase slightly the electric field to increase the slope. So what we do is that we apply a ramp of electric field, which increases linearly in time, and the field will reach at different times the threshold to ionize it above the lower state. So you will have get now you will get now a signal uh, which will tell you whether the atom was in state E and G, and you get a bit of information per atom, atom in E or atom in G, and this is the information you get from uh, the atom about the field in the cavity. Just a brief uh, summary of what we do when the atom and the field are resonant. We start, for instance.